Hello, hello and welcome wonderful listeners to another enthralling episode of Love People Technology Learning Podcast and I'm your lively host Tamara Kacharova, CEO Lane's AI and I could not be more thrilled to have you back for another riveting adventure into stimulating conversation. Each episode is like embarking on a quest to honorous hidden treasures for wisdom and captivating narratives. So if we go back 10 years or further before from today, what the training world would look like and the speaking world would look like is what I call the monologue with hostages experience, meaning the speaker or the trainer would be sitting there talking and throwing out lots of information and there would be no, very little to no interaction with the audience. If you think about what has happened over the last 10 years, we've got more tools to become much more engaging. And the newer generation, as we like to call it, they demand engagement. So for me, the motivation and, and my energy and passion is because I'm not working. I'm having fun when yes. I do this, right? So fun it's like to a me, game. it it's is like a game. It's like a game, right? Yeah. And, and I draw energy from audiences. So the moment I step onto a stage or I'm, I'm stepping into the platform of a training space, the lights are on and I'm ready to go. I'm happy to be there. I'm pouring into them. So the motivation is easy for me. I wanna that all businesses will be like this way. <laughs> <laughs> it's my wish. It's my wish. Yeah. That's why we'll never be out of a job because this will never yes. go away. We've got oh to help. Oh my him. God. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And today, meet my magnetic guest, a personality boss, controversial and captivating with an unforgettable surname and a gift for storytelling. Sandrick Love. Our paths across at a conference in Orlando back in March and we mingle among colleagues and I had the pleasure of attending his workshop where he shared his unconventional practices. I witnessed firsthand the electrifying energy he brings to a room. Over a hundred people rose to the feet in applause. Sardi Klav, it's not just your average international keynote speaker, author, or leadership expert. He's a master of his craft. With a specialization in management and leadership development, training delivery, and employee engagement, Sardik's expertise knows no bounds. Co-author of two acclaimed books, Presentation Skills, and Speak for a Living Second Edition, Sardik has left an indelible mark on audience worldwide. From Fortune 100 companies to high-tech organizations, his insights have inspired and educated managers and leaders across 32 countries. Today, we stand on the brink of an exhilarating journey poised to delve into a myriad of topics and that are sure to ignite inspiration and excitement in very listeners. Our focus in our dynamic realm of leadership development, training delivery, and employee engagement navigated by incomparable Sardi Club. Together we'll embark on an exploration of Sardi's vast expertise, uncovering the intricacies and nuances of effective leadership, communication, and human performance improvement. Get ready for an enlightening and empowering adventure that promises to leave you informed and inspired. So buckle up for an adventure brimming with insights and innovation at every turn. Welcome aboard our show. Sardik, welcome. <laughs> How are you doing? Mara, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I tell you what, that was one awesome introduction. So thank you for that. Um, wow. and it's amazing. Yeah. We can finish, right? <laughs> we're, we're done. We don't need we're to done. do anything else. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm done because you talk so much. I was like, that's great. This guy is great. <laughs> yes. Thank you. How are you doing? How is going? How is your Friday? Yeah, I'm doing well. I am uh, excited. I can't complain. Uh, life is good. I'm blessed. So things are well. Yes. Great. And it's truly fantastic to have you here today. And your presence is a gift to me and all our listeners. And uh, 
I can help but wonder about the journey that led you to become the captivating public speaker you are today. And of course, could you share with us how you found your path into public speaking? What moment or experiences made you realize that this was more than just a profession, but a calling, especially considering your background in risk management, which seems words apart from the stage. Tell us, please. Well, the, the short version of this, I'll take you and your listeners all the way back to my undergraduate days at Virginia Tech, which is where I went to school for college in Virginia. And um, when I was a freshman, Tamara, I was walking on campus to the dining hall as a freshman. And, and I you know, it was, was on campus for like two weeks, so I didn't really know anybody. And this gentleman had... Uh, I remember seeing him a couple of times as I'd walked to the dining hall. And on this particular day, he stopped me and he said, you know, I, I don't know who you are, but you have a great voice and I would like to invite you to be in a play. I had never acted or anything like that. And I was like, okay, whatever. So this play was a play that was for Sydney African-American community. It's an old wise tale and it's called Tell Pharaoh. And, you know, so I did this play and I was the only non theater arts major in this play. Everybody else was, were students in theater arts, and I wasn't. And that first experience, we, we practiced this play until we delivered it at Virginia Tech and then at North Carolina A&T. I had never been on a stage like that before, and it, it was like exhilarating. And this, this actually, believe it or not, included singing. Thank God it wasn't a solo for me because I can't sing, so my voice was just part of, hidden by others. But that moment back in 1986 was amazing to me to be on stage in a CD audience, right? So we fast forward to after graduation, I went to work for what's now Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield in Virginia. And I ended up going into the world of training. That's where I got introduced to training. And I fell in love with it. You know, I was, I was an underwriter first when I first got there. And then I went into training for underwriting. And that's when I really started learning more about the, the training side of things. And then I got introduced to this gentleman whose name is John Maxwell. And many of your listeners may be aware of John Maxwell. I started reading his books and became a, a big fan of his. And he did. And then I started going to conferences where he would speak. And I was enthralled with his speaking career. So uh, at the time that I was a trainer, I joined the Association for Talent Development. And all of that furthered my speaking, my training I got opportunities to speak and learn more about training. And as I led the training program, eventually at Anthem, that's how it all got started. And um, I left the training function, went into operations management because I felt like I needed that. But I never lost my passion for training. So eventually I came back and then the speaking just kicked off. So that's how I got started, all with a play. It's so great. And you told that's like... Uh, the man ask you uh, to sing and like use your voice like just like one thing like specific thing which you have like it happened like so fast and unexpected for us and now you are here it's like just like small start like small step for that and uh, Yes, I love it. And like I was surprised because you are from risk management like uh, specialization it's like, you know, for me, it's so boring because my specialization was the same, like economics, like management and economics. But like in the end of my, like, you know, uh, career in the biggest companies was uh, like I was facilitator and like in learning and development industry and risk management looks like so boring. I think, I think I've never been in your risk management trainings, but I think they're really engaging. Like you show showing us how does it work? I'm really confident about that. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> actually, if I may say this, back then, so I, I, I have two sides of my brain. I have the technical side of my brain, the risk management, performance consulting, and then I have this other side, which is the training, facilitation, speaking. But back then, when I was in risk management, I didn't do any training. What was interesting, I was not very good at training back then either. So when I first started training, that technical brain that I had, mm -hmm. I had never been trained in training. So I was a bad trainer early on. And we'll talk more about that later. But so so I had to learn and transform from the risk manager. That stuff didn't work so well when I actually went into the training and speaking world. But I think it's a great point which you talked about 
because like you know our listeners maybe uh, some of them uh have like have a dream to like to reskilling upskilling their like their professional industry and maybe you will tell some advice or your story because you told you was not so good in training and development you wasn't so good in like public speaking but like you wanted to be a speaker how does it work like from if you want to start to do something not in risk management or not in economics but you want to be in learning and development how does it work and maybe you will share like your experience in this part of your life so when i decided that i wanted to go into training and then eventually when i decided i wanted to be a speaker i did what everyone who wants to do something new or different should do and that is you go find people who are doing that you go consume as much as you can from their books their presentations, their trainings, their conferences, you do all of that, you go find the people who are already ahead of you. I think there's an old Chinese proverb, if you want to know the future, ask people who are coming back, right? So that's what I did. I sought out, you know, John Maxwell. I joined the John Maxwell team. I started, I joined the Association for Talent Development so that I could learn from them. And then the trainers who were trainers in, in the organizations that I worked at, I started getting insights from them. And I, I've got mentors in the areas where I wanted to grow. So all of those strategies and normal things, I just dedicated myself to doing all those things in addition to my core job at any given time. And um, that's how I did it. Yeah. And like, you know, I attended your presentation and saw the packed auditorium with over a hundred people, I think so, uh, eager to learn from your workshop on public speaking and practical tips for becoming and more successful uh, facilitator, I could tell how passionate and engaged you were in your work. As someone who's been a facilitator for over 20 years, mainly were in your work, uh, like involved in training facilitation, I inspired to be like you, to engage, impress, evoke emotions and apply those techniques because it's really important. I confident about that. But not everyone can do it like as effortlessly. Like, you know, it's a long journey. Like, where do you draw your energy and inspiration from? Where do you find the like material you share with the, your audience? What motivates you to pass on your knowledge and experience to others? So for me, the motivation and, and my energy and passion is because I'm not working. I'm having fun when yes. I do this. Right. So fun it's like to a me, game. It it's is a like game. a game. Right. Yeah. And, and I draw energy from audiences. So the moment I step onto a stage or I'm, I'm stepping into the platform of a training space, the lights are on and I'm ready to go. I'm happy to be there. I'm pouring into them. So the motivation is easy for me. Now, as far as where do I get my content from over the years, I used to do, you know, I learned other people's content. But then as most creators do and those who are passionate about what they do, I started creating my own content. And over the years, what I've ended up doing now, like most of us who do this, a lot of my content is based off of the research that I do. So at the core of who I am, I'm a researcher. So I'm constantly looking out, paying attention to themes, trends, and monitoring global markets and places that I compete in and things like that to stay on top of stuff. And then I write about it. And so I publish as a, and many of us now are content creators with, with the, since the pandemic, everybody's gone into using Zoom and other tools. So a few things. I write laws, right? So I write things like um, the law of engagement. I wrote this law because engagement always begins by asking a question. If you want to connect with people, you got to get them curious. So I write laws and then I create models and frameworks to simplify my process so that everybody can do it. So I've created things like the engagement loop which uh, you saw. And then uh, I publish a lot. So like you're doing here with a podcast, I have a video blog series called the Ask a Master Facilitator video blog series. And that comes out every Monday. And what I do with that is I take questions from training professionals and give solutions. So I get the questions and that answer to that question becomes content, helps me to produce mm -hmm. my content. And then lastly, I wrote two books and I'm going to be writing more, but the two are there on the screen here, Presentation Essentials, and then the Speak for a Living second edition. So that's where I get my content. I produce it, I write it, and then I use it in my um, programs. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing because, you know, now it's a world. We have several type of people, 
First of all, it's the people who create the content, like an author. And second part, people who use it, like who read it, who watch it, who listen it. And I love that I can be like in the first part and second part and you as well. Like, yes, it's great. And I agree with you when you have research type of mindset, it's great because you can analyze everything what happened all over the world and you can create your own thoughts like your own models or something and like yes it's great i think it's great when you can mix some theories and your personal experience and your like analyzed decision which you have yes it's a great and i love it and sardi could you share how you define success as a facilitator because it's so interesting question for me maybe like i have always in my mind Uh, what happens after a session that makes you go, yeah, I nailed it, that went really well, like it, it was amazing. What does, maybe not success for you, but of course success for the audience look like for you in the facilitator professions? Now, that's a fantastic question. And I'll start out by saying it this way. Great facilitators, they trade control for contribution. Okay, and I want your audience to reflect on that. Great facilitators trade control for contribution. And what I mean by that is most people in the training function, they want to control everything and they don't want to let control go. So they tell, they start going into telling mode and that disengages people. So a successful facilitator trades control for contribution. Now your audience may be wondering, how did they do that? The number one skill for an exceptional facilitator is to ask questions. And the reason that's why I said the law of engagement, engagement always begins by asking a question. See, by asking a question, I'm creating curiosity. And by doing that, the law of curiosity says everything of value first began as a question. So when you start thinking about these things, it becomes very easy to see that for facilitator success is helping people change their perspective. Because here's something that most people don't realize about training. They think that training, after somebody goes through training, they think that people automatically will change their behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not no, true. What not typically true. Yeah, what typically happens, you know this, what typically happens is our role is, as a trainer, is to help people change their perspective first because they will not change their behavior until they change their perspective. So you've got to challenge what they believe to be true. And the best and only, particularly one of the best ways, not the only way, but the best way is to create curiosity and ask them questions that challenge their th thinking, their beliefs, their assumptions. So successful facilitator is getting the audience to hear a question, reflect on the answer and have it challenge their status quo because now they'll be willing to consider to change and adopt whatever you're teaching them to do. And you can see that happen in the audience because the way that you know that you're successful and that the audience is taken away from that, that situation, just like you saw. You saw the engagement when you were in my session. People were openly talking about what we were talking about. I just asked questions. And now that's the key. When the dialogue happens at the local table level in training, you're doing good. Yes, it's a great because like in my opinion, we are in the same page because uh, always I talk about and like uh, in my opinion that's when your audience comes out from the room and they like some people ask them how it was and they told oh it was great I did it by myself facilitator no 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 it's just my work it means they have a motivation to change something and they have like idea that they did it by themselves. And if we are thinking that we done something by ourselves, we started to do it by ourselves. And it's, it's a great. And of course, I agree with the questions. And I have now idea because I certified coach and it looks like a training in coaching style. What do you think about that? Like, where is the, you know, uh, in the line between training model and like training with a coaching model? The skills are very similar because what does a coach do? A coach asks lots of questions to help them come to some clarity and, and to some, you know, come to the decisions on their own. So trainers, the best trainers are those who do the exact same thing, but they do it with mass numbers, not just one on one. So that's the main difference. Yeah, yes, 
Thank you. And, you know, you started to talk about questions. And yes, I've read a lot about you, about your different kind of techniques, which you use uh, in your trainings. And I was in your session. And I believe the same that's engaging participants through experiential activities can significantly enhance the effectiveness of training. And let's talk about this deeply. Like, could you share some another innovative, maybe examples of uh, experiential activities that you found particularly effective in boosting uh, participant engagement and facilitating knowledge retention? Sure. Well, I'll give you the one that I'm very well known. I, I did this in 2011 at the ATD International Conference and Exposition in Orlando, I think it was that year. 2011. As, 2011. Oh, my God. It was the first time I did years it. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. First time I tried that. And, and um, so what it was, it's the greatest metaphor for change ever. Here's what I do. I challenge the audience and I say, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about change and managing change in 10 minutes or less. And what I ended up doing was I asked them, give me, I asked the audience, I'll say, give me, um, what are the characteristics of people who are very adaptable to change? And I'll tell them they got a minute to talk in their table groups and come up with those characteristics. So they'll do that. Then I'll have the audience, you know, share those with me. So what are those characteristics? And they'll say adaptable, they'll say risk-taking, they'll say flexible, uh, willing to try, all those. And so I'll say, okay, I'm going to take you through an experience. And then I use their exact words, but that experience is going to require you to be adaptable, to be flexible, to be a risk taker, to be willing to try. And and I say, but I'm going to tell you up front, it's going to be bad at the beginning. But if you go through it with me, because as a leader, I wouldn't ask you to do anything I'm not willing to do with you. If you go through this process with me, I promise you it's going to not feel good at the beginning. It's going to be great at the end. So if you're willing to go on this journey, here's what you're going to do. And then I pass these out. Or they're already out. So I and on screen, um, just make sure you can see it. These are warheads, right? So, so your audience, warheads. And if you're familiar with warheads, what they are, they're extreme sour candy when you put them in your mouth. And then over about a minute, they become super sweet. And in this case, there are five different flavors when I buy them, right? So at the table level, they have all different flavors. And so they put it in their mouth with me. And then I'm facilitating, taking them through this whole process of it's disgusting and the facial expressions are amazing. And I was like, that's what change feels and tastes like when you, when you invoke it on somebody. But now you just take some time and go through the process. In about 30 seconds, I'll ask, how many of you, the candy's getting sweet? Raise your hand. Not every hand goes up. So I'll say, here's the best tip I can give you as a leader. If you have not felt that uh, sweetness just yet, best tip I can give you, suck it up. And the crowd goes wild, right? And they're like, they laugh and all that. And I'm like, yeah, suck on it because change requires us to suck it up. We've got to go through it, blah, 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 blah. And now then I get through the two myths of change through that. Now I do all of this in 10 minutes with a single piece of candy. Yeah. Tamara, that activity, I call it a taste of change. This activity has made me famous in the training world. I've done this with thousands of people all over the world. And here, like you said, 13 years later, people still walk up to me at conferences and say, I remember that candy thing that you did. That was so amazing. So that's one that I just created with something that's readily available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you'd like me to go and show you another one really quickly that I use, that's very yes. effective. Yeah. Yes, you so, can. Yeah. So here's another one that I use. Now, this is a classic one that many of you out there in the training world might have used. So this one is about communication. If you want to make sure that, and you talked about coaching, right? And the questioning. If you want to put people to make sure that they can communicate and ask questions, here's what you do. You give your audience, in your whether it's a conference or uh, if you're doing training, you give each pair, you have people pair up, and then you give them a cup. And I'm going to represent my university, Virginia Tech. So yes. give them a cup that's empty and then give them a cup that is mostly f- filled with water. And what they're going to do with that, they're going to pair up sit knee to knee, like we're, if we were facing each other right now, we'd be sitting there and one of us, one at a time, and I would be on my side, you would be my coach. So my, you know, the other person like you would be the coach. Your job would be to coach me to pour this water from one glass to the other, to the empty cup, but I have to have my eyes closed. And when I do it, I cannot touch the glasses. So when I do it, it has to be a free pour yeah. and I can't touch those glasses, right? And so I can't get wet. Your job yeah. as a coach is to keep me from getting wet. 
And that freaks everybody out. Now, we do this activity. We can do the whole activity with both of us going and doing it in less than 10 minutes. And it's a great debrief of a coaching. Now, and that gets the whole point across of, so then the debrief is, what did your coach do to keep you safe? What did he or she do? To, what questions did she ask? What did you do? You just go through that quick little debrief. Those two activities, mm-hmm. communication and change, guess what they address? The biggest yeah. challenges that organizations and people are facing in organizations, communicating effectively and change. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. And you know, now I understand that's like, you shown me like two different kinds of techniques about like which you can implement for engage your audience. It means when you work like a facilitators or like a speaker. Yes, of course, sure. We we don't need just to talk, to watch or uh, show something, and we need to give like something which we can try to feel. Like to have our uh, own experience, it means we have like different kinds of body change and it means we can change our mindset because it's something which triggered uh, like us inside us and it can uh, associate like uh, some action, what happened before and after. And after that, we want to do it or we want to change it because like these two examples, it's not just about like, you know, it's not about like uh, some communication skills or like about some techniques which we need to implement in our business work. But it's about changing in our behavior. It's about our mindset and it's big challenge. It's a big challenge. Like I think it's the biggest because we can start to do something just like you told when we change our like mindset and we flip it like from one side to another side. Exactly. And this is based on the science. See, I do a lot of research and what I'm known for and my most popular keynote right now is the science of engagement. So there's a, there's a lot of science behind doing these activities. Most trainers, when they do activities like this, what they'll do is they'll do it from a game perspective or they'll just do it as an icebreaker. No, this is very scientifically based. You just said the operative word and you said it has an emotion to it. So you can remember on when you poured that water, what were your emotions when you were uh, your eyes were closed? You were scared. And so you were very attentive because when you're scared, you're very attentive when someone's coaching you. You remember that emotion and that's the experience. We learn through emotions and experiences. We create memories that are basically like reels, video reels, combined with emotions underneath them. And when a trainer yeah. understands how to use experientials to create the emotion, you now automatically create a memory for change. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I love it. And it's a, it's a great example of how, how to do that and like how does it work. I love it. And you know, I love your candy experiment because... I did it with my kids because my oh, kids, yeah. <laughs> they love these candies yes. and they love different tastes. And they give me, sometimes they give me a different kind of taste. And mommy, how is it? How is it? And like, you know, they're <laughs> waiting for my reaction, my emotions. And like, oh, is it sore or like uh, my face? And they love it. And I did it before. And I was so excited to do in your training. And of course, I remember what happened in the, like with the people around me and how it was with you. And like, yes, it's, it's a great experience. And I have a next question because you've been leading public speaking and presentation skills workshops for over 10 years, like 20 years. And you were doing it 10 years ago. You were doing it five years ago and you are doing it now. So tell me, what's the difference in public speaking skills between 10 years ago and now? What competencies and presentation skill are taking their, you know, spotlight these days? And what's really crucial, something you can do without when it comes to leading presentation, conducting workshops, uh, performing and like really connecting with people when you are up on stage? So if we go back 10 years or further before from today, what the training world would look like and the speaking world would look like is what I call the monologue with hostages experience, meaning the speaker or the trainer would be sitting there talking and throwing out lots of information and there would be no, very little to no interaction with the audience. Most of it was very 
one way communication. And I, that's why I call it the monologue with hostages. So that was one thing that happened back then. Also back then, the content wasn't necessarily based on what the needs of the audience were. It was mostly based off of what people thought, you know, whether it was a manager or the, the client, whatever they thought. There was really no desire and very little emphasis placed on needs assessments back then. So it was just train what we think they need training on, make it one way and, and just sit there and listen. And so therefore there would be no engagement. Now, if we fast forward to today, if you think about what has happened over the last 10 years, we've got more tools to become much more engaging. And the newer generation, as we like to call it, you know, depending upon where you are in your life, they are the, the younger generations, those generation uh, Zs and, and millennials, they demand engagement. So what is required now is a multi-sensory approach to engagement of training and skill development. So you've got to engage all the senses, whether it's eyesight, seeing, feeling, tasting, hearing, you've got to engage all those multi-sensory tools so that people are actively engaged because we are easily distracted with technology, as you already know, and everything that's all around us. So today, you better be engaging. It's not monologues with the hostages. It's now a dialogue to create uh, curiosity for change. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, like to continue this thought, I don't remember who was a speaker. He talked about kids and family and parents, and uh, he talked about that if we want to have a discussion with our kids in the table when it's dinner, we need to be more interesting than YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and everything what happens with me. I think it's the same what you are talked about with our audience because we have a lot of content Like now I can open YouTube or something and I can find different kinds of interesting content which I need in like for my professional development or something. And always I have a question why I need to go to this real training, like in person training or like uh, this session in a conference, why I need to spend my time there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about that. I think so. You're right. And, and to your point around, um, so what you just described was we're always competing for attention, right? Like you just said with the kids, you've got to be as a parent more interesting than the technology and all that. So I wrote a law around this. I told you I write laws. So the law of attention, the law of attention says attention goes where curiosity grows, You've got to create wherever that curiosity is. That's where a person's attention is going. So if you're a mom and you're talking, blah, 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 and they're not curious about what you're saying, but they're more curious about what's on their Instagram feeds and reels and all that, that's where their attention goes. Same with adults. So the law of attention, attention goes where curiosity grows. When we understand that, we know we're competing for attention. So your content's got to be relevant. And we're going to talk about how you make it relevant shortly. Yeah. And maybe some tips, what's the difference which you see 15 years ago, we did not do it in virtual, but like now we can be a facilitator in person and in virtual. What's the difference? Maybe several your practice tips in virtual trainings, because like in virtual, uh, you cannot give us like candies or water or something, but like how to be so interesting for your audience in virtual, maybe several tips. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things I would say to you is, and I'll, I'll just mention it in the book, Presentation Essentials, what we did here, we, we actually have a chapter presenting online and tips on that. That's chapter 10, um, presenting, uh, delivering content online or delivering, yeah, it is delivering content online. So some tips here, when it comes to engagement, the delivery, think of engagement, the law of engagement always applies. Engagement always begins by asking a question. So we have to ask questions. Now think of delivery methodologies or modalities like in-person versus virtual versus hybrid. Think of those as just different ways of doing delivery. So different cars, if you will, uh, delivering, you know, so once you know how to drive a car, you know how to drive, you know, a different type of car. You can drive a Honda versus a Toyota versus a Jeep. So those are three different types of cars. That's the same analogy I'm using here with, with engagement in terms of virtual. The difference here in virtual is You've got to use your tools that your platform allows you to create engagement. So I did a study of this 
and I asked training professionals, what percentage of all of your trainers, what percent of you of you are actually using breakout rooms, whether it's in Zoom or in these others? 48% at the time that I did that survey, 48% said they were not using breakout rooms. And a breakout room, as you know, is the equivalent, if it's in person, of a table group activity. So that's doing no group activity whatsoever. And what most people do virtually, here's what not to do. Do not think of asking a question to the entire group and saying, respond in chat. That is not engaging. That is a passive learning method because that, that means I don't have to respond if I don't want to. And the facilitator can't see if they're asking questions of everybody and see if everybody's actually responding. So here's a short tip. Whenever you're doing virtual, this applies in person as well, but when you're doing virtual in particular, you've got to use many more active learning methods, getting them to do things, paired up chats, getting them to do breakout rooms a lot, getting them to do things, small group activities virtually. Those all are active learning methods. You've got to do that more so in virtual because if you don't, people will check out faster because they, get, they can turn the cameras off and they can do anything else they want. So that's the quick short answer is more active learning methods than passive learning methods. And most of virtual training is actually built off of passive learning methods. Yes, it's, it's like a balsam to my heart. And it's a like, big pain for me because I'm from in-person training convert to a virtual trainer because uh, Lane's AI, it's a professional software for virtual classroom. And we believed in virtual classroom trainings like before pandemic started. Like we started, like we designed our platform in 2000, I think 18th, we started like to work with our customers. And it's a big pain for me that yes, people now in the virtual trainings, they use presentations and sometimes chats, and that's it. Sometimes breakout rooms, but we know that's um, active learning. It's not about breakout rooms too, because uh, in real classroom training, it does not call breakout rooms. It's called moderation. It's called role-playing games. Correct. It's called um, uh, brainstorming. It's called... Um, I don't know, maybe a case study or something mm -hmm. like Teach when, yes. yeah, when you have uh, like world cafe, do you know this activity when mm -hmm. people uh, around the class, they have like some uh, topic in one group and after the like five, six minutes, they need to change the rotate the groups and mm -hmm. like ask another questions and add some ideas to another question in virtual we created in lane some special activities for that. But like in real life, facilitators, they don't know about that because they use just like presentation and chat. It's enough. But no, it's not enough because it's the same. You told it's the same, just like, like with cars, just like we change the tool, but like methodology stand the same. We need to continue work with like facilitators, presenters, skills in virtual, in person. Like it's it's a great because for me it's a hard because the heart of the like learning processes it's methodology and of course facilitators skills. We need to connect it and of course like uh, uh, audience goals which they have for learning processes. Like yes, it's 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 really true. And Sadik, picture this. I am someone eager to grow in the field of facilitation or public speaking. Where do I start? Maybe like, what should I read? What should I watch? Where should I go to learn? Like drawing from your experience and uh, hiccups um, along the way, what do you recommend? Like, yeah, because I think maybe it, it will be interesting for our listeners and like maybe some quick recommendation. And I know you have your own facilitators course. Yes. Like tell about, yeah. about well, this. So just to, and I'll talk about my stuff, but I'll also talk about the overall stuff out there too, right? I'm going to come back and hit something that you just said and, and around all of this. You, you mentioned that, so for engagement and for delivery and facilitation, we've got to do two things. If engagement is this, what we really want to do, we have to understand that there's two parts to engagement. Engagement has to be both a design situation and a facilitator skill set. And I always say it this way, engagement begins first by design, then by delivery. So engagement begins first by the design of the course, 
and then a facilitator delivers it in an engaging way. So you've got two parts. And typically people, when they are trainers, if they don't have the design piece, they design their courses with passive learning, so therefore it's boring. And they don't even know that they've created a course that's boring by design. And then if they don't have facilitation skills, they're also facilitate or delivering it in a boring way. So now you're double boring. So yes, now, absolutely. Yeah, and that, now, now you put the you and suck in the course, yes. right? So how yeah. do we overcome that? That's the question you just asked me. There are a variety of ways, but I'm going to simplify this for everyone, for your audience here. I just gave you a part of the answer is, first, you've got to get some course design skills. So instructional design, so that you know the difference between passive learning methods and active learning methods. You've got to know the difference so that you can look and see that you should have more active learning methods that you're using, like you just described, case studies, um, small group activities, and all those things, right? So that's one thing, design, instructional design. Number two, you've got to get facilitation skills. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Most training courses out there, and you could go to the Association for Talent Development, you could go to Longevin, I think it is, mm -hmm. all these other organizations, they will teach you training and they will say in some cases, and this is dis no disrespect, I actually facilitate for ATD as an expert. I teach their training and facilitation course. It's not facilitation. So facilitation is a higher level skill. Training delivery is one set, but facilitation is the next layer. It requires a bit more uh, understanding of the concepts of science of engagement and things like that. So where do you get that? You get that one place clearly would be from me. I have a course called Master Facilitator. The other place you would get something, you would get things from books on facilitation. There are others out there offbeat that provide stuff. My book, Presentation Essentials, has lots of techniques on facilitation built into it. The other thing I would explain here is there are different types of presentations, right? So, for example, in Chapter 3 in Presentation Essentials, we talk about the different types of presentations. And most trainers don't realize that presenting and training and speaking are all very different. And then lastly, I'll just say, of course, I do, a, like I mentioned earlier, I do a weekly video blog series, Ask a Master Facilitator. That's a great place to come and learn all the different facilitation techniques. So you can do it in a variety of different ways. But if you're going to go look, Google facilitation techniques and skills, and you'll find a host of options there, or you can reach out to me. But that's the only way to do it. And most people, when they call it training facilitation, I can tell you it's really not. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I agree with you. And uh, I want to see your more videos because I saw some of them and I want to continue learn. And like, you know, it's great when you can develop your skills like all your life because people from learning and development, we need to be like lifelong learning people. It's a first rule. I'll give yeah, you a like, tip real quick, if I may. Here's yeah. how you can tell if you're if you're looking at a course that is going to teach mm -hmm. you facilitation skills, at the end of that course, can you take any content that you've never seen before within a matter of give you 10 minutes? If I gave you 10 minutes to say, I'm going to give you this book and you've got 10 minutes to read chapter six, and then you have to facilitate that content and do a teach back, a trainer trainer for chapter six. If you can do that with only seeing that content for 10 mm -hmm. minutes, that's what a facilitator does. It's a great, does. Yes, yes. That's the difference it's, it's between training great. and facilitation. I don't need to know everything. I just yeah. need to know how to guide people through yeah. the learning process. Absolutely. Yes, I love it. Thank you. And, you know, now I want to like shifting our focus to the like corporate landscape because it's, it's really interesting for the audience. And it's evident that training methodologies are consistently evolving. And Sardik, from your perspective, uh, what's currently in high demand in corporations when it comes to training and what trends are emerging and perhaps more intriguingly, what practices um, are starting to fade away as organizations adapt to new realities? Yeah. So corporate training, they are under the gun to produce faster. The pandemic changed everything. You know, we, we went to what I call the era of performance acceleration, where companies and their, their, the stakeholders want timelines on development to be shrunk. I just did a keynote for a conference. It was called Chart. Um, that's the Council of Hotel and Restaurant Trainers, Chart. And in Chart, when I did research about, and this is, you know, hotels and restaurants training. When I did research about them, 
the people who are like the operators of hotels and restaurants, they want the training for new employees, onboarding training to be shrunk. The average time it takes is 19 days. They want that shrunk by seven days down to 12. That is not uncommon in most corporate situations. They want that timeline to proficiency to be shrunk. Here's the problem. Most training is not built to improve performance. It's built to deliver content. And that's a very different situation. So trends right now, what's, what's in high demand from a corporate perspective is training that actually leads to performance improvement. And that actually leads to the, one of the big trends. So performance consulting, which is what I am at the heart, performance consulting is one of the big mega trends that is coming. It's already here. So for those of you who are trainers, if you can't build, deliver, and create training that actually leads to some level of demonstrated performance improvement, your training is going to be under the gun. That's number one. Another trend that's coming out is this whole thing, and you're in it, uh, Tamara, is personalization of learning. We can't just do one size fits all. We've got to do all kinds of things, push you know, to mobile and all these different ways of delivering content just in time and all that creating follow-up. That is a huge trend. It's no longer just they show up one night stand kind of training and off they go. No, this is a relationship that we got to stay in touch. So that's another um, thing. And that ties me back into the third trend, which is digital, the digital workplace and the, the huge impact that your business and everybody else's use of technology. So we've got to be able to do that. So trainers who are not adapting and moving into these digital capabilities, you're getting left behind pretty quick. And then the last one I w- that I see out there is around skills. So we've got to be able to define exactly what are the skills that are required to produce success. And most trainers can't do that. That's more of a, an instructional design or more into performance consulting. And so those are the big trends that are going to emerge and be pretty intense over the next few years, in addition to AI and all that. Yes. The first point was about like how to change your training from like 19 days to seven days because companies, organizations, they're thinking about how to save money and start to earn money faster. Yes. Sure. And like, it's a time of the employees and it's uh, like salaries. It's not just about training. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a great. And yes, I agree that it's a uh, performance consulting will help with that too. Like how to change the program, how to do it faster, but like with the same effectiveness for the employees and for their like businesses it's it's a big challenge and like yes i i saw it and like when i was chief learning officer in the investment company it was the same always we talked about like how to do it like faster or like not so expensive but like with the same effectiveness <laughs> good luck now let, let me give you a, a question that most training professionals to your point and i want to be clear about this that your clients are going to come and say we got to shrink the time that you invest in training and developing that's not the right answer absolutely that is not the right answer here's a question that i would tell to training professionals here's a question for training professionals. i'm looking at the camera looking at you i want you to take <laughs> look at think about your most frequently delivered training program that you deliver right now here's a question i would have for you how, think about at the end of your training, after your training is done, how long is it before the people who attended your training reach the level of proficiency that the managers expect? 90%, I continue to do this research, 90% of all training professionals cannot answer that question. They have no idea after someone leaves their training, how long is it going to take for that, that employee to get to proficiency that the manager expects? And that's the problem. That's where the answer lies is they want shorter time to proficiency. Mm -hmm. So they come and push you to have shorter time in the classroom. You do that without understanding the impact on proficiency. You just destroyed your credibility as a training group. But like, you know, uh, the second part of this like question, it will be that's uh, the success of in place, it's not just about training because we need to create the program, like training program, onboarding program implemented in the business processes. It means if you have like one hour, like in person or virtual classroom, like training about, I don't know, how to sell new product, like, or how to communicate with the customers. It means after that, we need to design 
some business process with the managers, how to implement this skill which we talked about in the business process. Because like we, we told, if I did just one time exercise in a gym, it does not mean that I'm like a muscle person now and I'm so strong and I do a lot because I need to do it like step by step, like yes. every day, like every minute. It means it, it's it's about that. I think so. It's not Absolutely. just about like 15 days or like seven days. It's it's like one long process and onboarding process is really important, but like it depends on managers. And now it's so, I think, I, I don't know, I agree or no. Now managers' roles are really more important than before pandemic because we are working remotely and managers need to support the team like every day, every time. And everything depends on their work because remote work teams, like it's so hard to work and we need to support, we need to to talk, we need to meet, we need to like, we need to create uh, some atmosphere for trust and empathy and everything in virtual. Yes. And it's not about the training. Correct. Yeah. There's a whole lot in I there. Love it. You're right. So you're exactly right. I love it. I love it. And oh my God, I want to, I want to, that's all businesses will be like this way. <laughs> <laughs> it's my wish. It's my yeah. wish. <laughs> that's why we'll never be out of a job because this will never yes. go away. We've got to oh help. Oh my tonight. God. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And you know, I think like uh, all talks about like AI and uh, how AI can work like without real people, without like everything what's happened like in real life, I think we have always the job because we need to support business. We need to be more human. We need to be, and AI can support us, will be our supporter in this great life journey. Agreed. And next questions will be about like questioning skills because you, you talked about that and you've highlighted the significance of leadership, questioning skills and evaluating critical thinking and problem solving abilities as leaders strive to foster environments of innovation and adaptability. Could you enlighten us with some effective questioning techniques they can employ? How do these techniques not only enhance critical thinking skills, but also encourage a culture of continuous improvement and problem solving within teams. Yeah. So this is where it gets really interesting from a scientific perspective. And that's where my research and my performance consulting background comes into play. Let me explain this just briefly and then I'll give you the technique. Yeah. So as a performance consultant, what that really means is I'm the type of person that has the, the processes and knowledge and ability to go into an organization. And if there's a performance gap, I can look at three things. I can look at the people, I can look at the processes, and I can look at the organization. I have tools and methodologies to evaluate at all three levels, people, process, and organization, and determine where the gaps are occurring or what the source of those performance gaps, right? So the organizational goal might be we got to get sales increased by 10%. And then we drill down one layer to, to look at the processes. So what are the processes that are required to produce that 10% sales increase? Then we drill down deeper to the individual employee and what do the employees behaviorally need to be doing to produce using those work routines and mm -hmm. work processes to create the sales increase of 10% at the global. Okay, so now having said that, that's what I do. Most trainers don't know how to do that, okay? When we come back to leadership, here's what. When I go down and drill into the performance at the work routine level and the individual employee level, what I'm actually doing, and this is revolutionary for your trainers, what I'm actually doing there is I'm looking for the habits that employees use to produce results. For example, if I go back to the water pour activity, representing Virginia Tech, cups yeah. again, right? right? <laughs> welcome. Right, okay, welcome, right? So if look at the behavior that's required to pour this water. I've got to touch, I can't touch these cups. So to do this repeatedly, I, as a performance consultant, am looking at what are the habits that a person is using to continuously and successfully pour that water from one cup to the other. That's what I'm looking for, those habits and routines. And in the workplace, the work routines are the habits that people do. Now, if you get this, what I'm looking for now is just the habits of success. I isolate those down to very simple habits. And I'm coming all the way back to answer your question with that understanding that what leaders do 
the number one way to a leader engages his or her employees is actually the same thing that I told you about the law of engagement. The law of engagement said that engagement always begins by asking a question. You see, when, when they ask a question, if you look at Gallup's research, all the Gallup Q12, those 12 questions, are all based off of does the employee feel like the manager has created a space where they care, they ask for their input, and they matter. So engagement is the key, the best and most effective way to get engagement is to a question. So now let's get to the, the real question that you or the answer that you ask. So what are some of the most effective techniques for asking questions from a leadership perspective? They actually happen to be the same no matter whether you're a leader, you're a trainer, the role doesn't matter. If your job is to engage people and help them grow, to help them change their perspective, the habit is the same habit. I'm going to reveal it to everyone. I rarely ever give this away for free. I'm going to give it to you. And I can give it to you all because it's hard. You don't do it now. I call it my curious ask method, ASK. Be a curious ask. There are questions that you should ask and a leader does this, a highly engaging, highly effective leader does this, just as a highly engaging facilitator does it. They ask questions that begin with two words. Those two words are what and how. Now, here's the science behind this. Here's why this works. What and how questions. Why are they the difference makers? You know, so if you were to look at a book like Atomic Habits, James Clear's Atomic Habits, or if you looked at The Power of Habits, Charles Duhigg's book, or if you looked at um, Jay Papasan and, and Gary Keller, The One Thing, they all talk about the habits. What's the one habit that sets everything else up? The asking of a question that begins with what and how is the key habit for success in questioning techniques, because here's why. What and how questions are opinion questions, meaning I'm asking you, Tamara, what do you feel? Or how question is, I'm asking you for your opinion. What do you think? How would you do that? And when people are asked for an opinion, here's the thing. I say this in a funny joke way. Opinions are like rear ends. Everybody's mm -hmm. gotten one. So <laughs> if you ask a person for their opinion, they're going to tell you because yes, they love to give their opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so Everybody. what now? Everybody. <laughs> and it's universal across cultures. What and how? What do you think? How do you think? What? What? How? How? If you focus on asking just those two questions, as a leader, as a facilitator, you get engagement out the roof. Absolutely. And you can influence the world because if you have the answers, you can influence about everything in the world, like, you know. And uh, I know that's like, it's so, sometimes it's uncomfortable to ask the questions because, uh, you are afraid that people don't have the opinion, but you need to wait and you start to talk because people can be silent. Like, they, uh, what do you mean? Um, um, and it's a conversation. And I think you told two interesting questions, what and how. And, you know, we talked about coaching questions and uh, I know like Dilt's pyramid and like, you know, the high level of uh, the questions, it's not about just what and how. And I remember that we talked uh, in some leadership trainings with the leaders about why it's so important for you, for yourself. What's your mission about that? And what, why do you think so? Because it's about like your motivation. It's about like your emotions. And it will be great if you will ask your team about that point, because it, it will give you, we talked about like that's emotions and like our actions and like in our habits are so important and like, but it's a next level. How you told like training, uh, like uh, to be a trainer or facilitator, it's a different kind of level and it's a new level. You need to start like from something like so simple, yes. <laughs> implement it in your uh, work. And after that, you can go like to up levels because Correct. it's really important to ask people about why and what's so important for you mm -hmm. and what do you think about that and like how do you feel about that because it's, it's, really, it's really important for us. Yeah, and, and to your point, so this is as a performance consultant and a habit. See, most trainers don't realize they are actually not trainers. Their habit formation specialists. They begin the train. Their training is meant to build this, the habits and routines that they're going to use back on the job to be successful in that job. So it's not training. It's actually habit formation. They don't own the habit formation 
entire process. They own mm-hmm. the beginning of the formation of the habits. Once they understand that, that's why atomic habits, the power of habits, anything around habits or the one thing, understanding how people and performance actually works through habit formation sets you apart. And as a facilitator, now you understand that you can engage anybody about anything because mm-hmm. it's asking them for their thoughts. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, one of my favorite question is dedicated to trends. Honestly, of course, I analyze a lot of trends all over the world, uh, like in a tech, in educational technology and in HR technology, because my industry now is about like technology in uh, learning and development industry. But of course, so like important for me and trends in learning and development, like some kind of trainings and like everything what happens in the world with the like employees. What do you envision um, as the upcoming trends and hurdles in talent development? Moreover, how can organizations like proactively prepare to address these challenges and seize emerging opportunities in the realm of professional development? What do you th- see like from your work? Yeah, I, I come back to, again, performance consulting. I think a consultative approach is going to be, it's a trend that's already here and Mm -hmm. it's going to be the great separator for most organizations where if the ones who can develop their employees faster and get that time to proficiency to productivity shortened and do it relatively uh, standard in a standard way, they're going to beat everybody else. So if you think this kind of came about when we saw this in the pandemic, think about how organizations had to shift very quickly in the way they delivered services. One of my favorite examples was a grocery chain. When the pandemic was in full effect and you couldn't really interact with people, they opened up and and redesigned their entire process of sales, point of sale, where they had the food being delivered out in the curb, curbside service. When that particular chain, I forget which one it was at the time, when they did that, they were able to not lose any staffing whatsoever. And by the way, an, an organization who has done this magnificently in terms of looking at using performance consulting techniques to improve productivity is Chick-fil-A. Mm-hmm. The way yeah. they continue, if you look at any Chick-fil-A compared to the other competitors, because Burger King is one of my clients, right? So mm-hmm. I've done Super My clients Shopper. too. Yes, okay. I, I love yeah. Burger King. <laughs> so I've, I've worked with them and they asked me at one point to look at what is Chick-fil-A doing? Because you can see a line at Chick-fil-A and, and they would be efficient. And get people through, but the same line over at Burger King or at McDonald's would be horrifically, the experience would be horrifically different, right? And what it was is their trainers, because I happen to have a little bit of experience talking to some of their trainers, they were using performance consulting techniques to actually analyze what did it take for that drive through mm-hmm. process and re engineer. You said this early on in, in, the, in the podcast, um, is re engineering your processes to meet the needs so that those employees can work more efficiently. That's the big trend is looking at process efficiency and training that helps integrate into that and develop the employee Mm -hmm. for that. That's going to be much more prevalent today and going forward. And we're going to use more assisted tools with AI and everything else to help us with that. That's the big Mm -hmm. trend. Yes, I love it. Yes, I love this trend. And like, uh, I think together with uh, like um, technology and uh, people's mindset, we can make great products for the businesses, uh, for their learning and development. And uh, together we can support like the big businesses all over the world. I, I know it and it's, it's really true. And we talked about like worldwide experience. And uh, uh, by the way, I'm really amazed by your extensive Experience working across diverse cultures undoubtedly offers valuable insights into leadership development. Sardik, having had the privilege to work in the 25 countries. Uh, 32. Oh, yes, 32. 32. Yes, sorry. And how has this global explosion influenced your approach to leadership development? What cross-cultural lessons have you learned that have shaped your perspective on effective leadership uh, practices. 
I'm really curious about that. Well, that's a fascinating question, right? Because it's been fascinating to me to work in all different parts of the world, whether Absolutely. it's in, in the Eastern Bloc, whether it's Russia, whether it's in yeah. the Asian Bloc, Southeast Asia, like Thailand or Malaysia, or if it's down in um, the Latin American countries, Brazil, Mexico, Central America, or here in America, North America, here in, and I'm going up to uh, Toronto, Canada here in a few weeks. What's been really fascinating to me, Tamara, over the time is... Number one, people are people. Okay, so people have human needs. And now, you, you, it's just like taking variations of cultural differences. There's the foundational needs underneath, and then there's the cultural aspects that make that culture you know, unique to it, it, itself. So you have to adapt your leadership style based on the cultural norms that are there, because culture drives everything. And the leaders who understand that and operate effectively in that are the best leaders. Now, when you start talking about a globalization where we have such a, a globalization, the leaders who are capable of integrating into those different cultural aspects globally and using the different tools that are required to engage people in those local cultures, that's where you get the real true leaders. So for me, it's been easy because I've been very fascinated to understand how does it work as a leader to be in the Middle East with that particular culture in all its nuances, right? For example, when I went into Saudi Arabia the first time, this was 2007, women were not in the workforce. We forward now to 2000 where we are today and women are driving. So I've seen a massive change in, in just a, you know, a lifetime. So you, you look at that kind of stuff and, or go over to China and you know, where they have a whole different concept Asking questions there of what and how may not necessarily work because of their cultural differences. So you've got to integrate different techniques over in that part of the world versus coming here to the U.S. where you have a much more competitive market. So you've got to adapt your leadership styles and understand the market that you're working in and the cultures that you work in and get those cultural norms and mm -hmm. then work it that way. Oh, yeah. And, you know, now I'm thinking about I listen to you about like, yes, different kinds of um, culture difference, like I called it a culture code, which we have and like, yeah. And I thought, it's so interesting. You traveled a lot and I have just like your life question. When you travel, you are thinking like when you first time uh, come to like some countries, you're thinking about the country, about the food, about the people, about like culture code, because you know something about that, but you've never been there. Tell me about like one country which was unexpected for you, because before you coming, you thought something, okay, maybe it's like so dirty country, or maybe it's like so amazed country, or like something like people like that, or like that. But you came and you saw that's another world and which you thought before, nothing. Yeah, I actually have two. My favorite was Russia, right? <laughs> you know, because as, wow. as, you, as you can imagine, most Americans, we, we you know, the, the news and everything else, you, yeah. you get this perspective, but I'm, the, I'm a culturally curious person. So I genuinely, wherever I go, I'm genuinely interested to find out and, and connect. And one of the things I do a lot is I go wherever I go, I try to connect with people. To, and I, you know, you know, the greatest way to connect with anyone anywhere is to have a meal with them. Yeah. 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 Because that, that's deeply personal and intimate. I, I didn't let the perspectives of what people would say here on the news or whatever about my color, my perspective around Russia. I just went in and just asked questions. Mm -hmm. And I was walking in Kamarovo, Russia, which is Siberia. Yeah. It's right? near... No, Komarova. Komarova, no. it's near St. Petersburg. It's a north. Yeah, it's very uh, north cold. Of yeah, Russia. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I would walk, and it was very cold at the time. Oh, it, it, maybe not Komarova, Kemerova. 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 It's, Kemerova. It's, yes, Kemerova. Yes. It's what, Siberia. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> Siberia. So I'm walking from the hotel. There was a market, like a mall, across, and it was, you know, it was like minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was a quick walk, and I'm walking with my translators, and as I walked. People stopped me. They want, and when I got in the mall, they wanted to talk to me, you know, and and because they don't see African American men in that part of Russia, they were fascinated. And they were like, "Do you rap?" I was like, "Do I look like I rap?" No, I don't. Rap. <laughs> I was like, "No, okay." So we we and I was engaging them, and you know, we had this great conversation. Every time I walked in that mall, people would stop me, and we would just exchange. I love that 
right? But most Americans probably would have been fearful to have a conversation like that. I engaged mm-hmm. them. And that made mm-hmm. me very popular. So um, that was one experience. Uh, just just loved it. And then um, Bellinis. Oh, my God. Bellinis in Russia are amazing. Like food, right? Which place? Uh, Bellinis, the, the, the ah, pancake thingy? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's one thing. The second one was actually in Liberia. Now, Liberia is West Africa. Yes. And it's, a, it's one of the poorest countries on the planet. Yes. These people have, um, if you go back and look at their history, they've been in civil wars for multiple years. Uh, going into that country, it's a war-torn country. The UN still has a presence there to keep them from fighting each other. Roads don't exist. You know, so most of the people, let's put it this way. When I was being transported to the one location where I was going to do training for this mining organization, I realized very quickly that I was, as I was looking at people, as I was, we were passing on what was no longer a road, it's just dirt mm-hmm. road. I'm seeing huts and people taking, washing themselves in water, dirty water. Yeah. And it dawned on me. I was like, there will be people that I will see on the side of the road that will never have ridden in an air-conditioned Toyota Land Cruiser like me. And so that was very profound to me. And when I got to Yakepa and, and other locations in Liberia, the first thing I wanted to do was, I didn't care about the training. I wanted to turn my attention to these people and find out what mattered most to them. It, they were such a beautiful people, such a beautiful, they told me their stories. That's the difference, right? That, so I don't worry about what people say. I go and let that experience happen. And it's such a fulfilling thing. Absolutely. And I think I know it. That's, uh, it's not about the country. Like all culture code, it's about people. It's like people. personality. Yes. It's like just, and uh, like I travel a lot too. And uh, I don't know how many countries where I traveled, like, but a lot in Europe and Asia. Mm-hmm. I've never, like, I've I've never been in Africa, like Zambia or something like that. I I just came to Egypt and mm-hmm. that's it. But like, of course, like the United States, Russia, and everywhere, I want to talk to people because if you want to know something uh, new about like culture code, about mm-hmm. like. A history about like philosophy about like it's a stories stories from stories. the people and Absolutely. like um, it's it's a great when you have uh, uh, this mindset and you are so open for for the people it's why it's so valuable for us and for for my life too yes mm-hmm. and we are on the same page I love it I yeah. love it it's life's trans it's transformational for for them and for us as trainers so yeah yeah. Yes. And maybe it will be my like last professional question and we will talk about your personal side, but like let's talk about like books and you've recommended several impactful books for personal and professional development. Could you share one key insight from like each book that has resonated deeply with you and how have these insights influenced your approach to training and like leadership or maybe in other like you know, okay. industry. Yeah. yeah. So I'll come back to my all time favorite book is right now is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Now mm-hmm. that book was written, what, five or six years ago. It's still a bestseller. Mm-hmm. I think James Clear wrote a book that is going to be the equivalent of the Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. That, you know, that book is a world class bestseller for decades. It was written back in the 30s. I think James Clear's Atomic Habits is that transformational. Because if you look at what he's done, he's simplified and and helped us understand the whole habit process in the workplace and how to manage through that. And he's giving you some techniques on that. So that book was transformational for me because it, as a performance consultant, I had the performance consulting methodologies, but I was still, before that book came out, I was still looking for a way to like graphically depict it. And he had it in his book. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's it. The light bulb went off. And and I've been running with based on that. So that's one, Atomic Habits. John Maxwell's Your Roadmap to Success. Yes, you told, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anything by John Maxwell, you can't go wrong with because he's the the key on leadership. And one that's been interesting to me more recently is Vanessa Van Edwards' book called Cues. C-U-E-S, Cues. And out of that book, she talks about how to read body language so that you can not manipulate Because I always like to say this with influence, because I have a course called Master Influencer. I can teach you how to influence people. And influence, when used for good, is good. When used for bad, it's bad. It's manipulation. 
right? So I always teach it and I teach it under the cautionary tale that. But you need the, to be natural. It you, means yes, you influence yes. if you are natural and but you know how to be right. like natural in your feelings and emotions. Exactly. It, it works and it's not manipulation. It's right. like, yeah. Exactly. So cues, she teaches you how to do and, if, and read people, body language and all that. So those are a couple of that or three or four of that are just hugely inf- um, impactful to me. And I think one that's going to be coming out, I'll mention this, it's not going to be out until next year. It, for those of you who are familiar in the training world with Jack and Patty Phillips, Jack, you know, um, is the ROI Institute, him and his wife, and they've written, I don't know, 70 books or something like that. So they're the gurus on in training evaluation at the ROI level. And he's one of my gurus. And, and they asked me to contribute the chapter to their new book, which is going to be, it's, the second edition is um, the ATD Handbook of Measuring and Evaluation Training second edition. That's going to come out in 2025. And that's the manuscript that I just held up. So they asked me to, to contribute the second chapter, which is analyzing performance gaps. So there's my performance consulting process yeah. is going to be in that book. So that's going to be a transformational book because it's been updated. This is a second edition in 2025. And, uh, and they've got several experts, myself and, and several others that are contributing as Great. they see it the leaders in the industry around this. So I would say when that book comes out for all of your audience, I would highly recommend you get it because I'm seeing the manuscript and I'm like, I can't wait to read the rest of this. Oh, wow. Great, 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 great. I love it. And But like if it's not a professional book, maybe like some non like. Uh, some fantastic or like I don't know which you love to read and what's your favorite book not from professional so not from professional um let me look over there and see unfortunately most of what I read <laughs> is going to be around professional I uh, know I know it was like it's it it's not just was the same it's the same with me because I need to read a lot of articles like books professional books or something but I love some kind of books like some worldwide yeah. authors yeah I'm, I'm looking to see if there's anything non-professional over there um, <laughs> and and the compound effect now that's a book by um darren hardy the compound effect that's i mean it, it can be a professional book but really what it's about is understanding that if you want to be successful it's about success because darren hardy writes all about success and what that book is all about is understanding that whatever you're doing compounds. So do the things that compound to get you to the outcomes that you want in life, whether it's losing body weight or being more successful personally in your relationships, whatever it is, use the compound effect. So there, there's one that, that is um, one I've used for a personal level to, to continue to do what I do and achieve personal success. Yes, great. And Sardik. Now I want to dive into your personal side and you know, yeah, like your interests, your passions, because you are not just a speaker or facilitator, you are a unique individual and every person who turns into my podcast is special in their own right. And you've got that school last name, love. So tell me, what does love mean to you? Share with us. (laughs) Well, you know, love to me means taking care of others. That's a simple answer and getting it in return. So, you know, give to to others. And this is kind of like the law of reciprocity. Love is the law of reciprocity. Pay attention and do what matters most to others and they'll return the favor, right? So love is about giving and changing, adapting and flexing to make sure you meet the needs of others. And that's uh, it's strange to have that last name considering that's what I, my life, I've dedicated my life to being is adding love to the world. And um, yeah, that's love. I love it. And you know, I love some type of these questions because my guests, they changed the voice when they're talking mm-hmm. about something like so deeper and so warm and mm-hmm. like, yes, everything was changed. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Because you know, when we're in professional, like we are so energetic, like, yes, yeah. we can, we can talk, we can discuss, we can, like, we have a lot of thoughts about that. But when you, we are thinking about something so important for us, mm-hmm. we go so deeply and like, yes, and I love it. And I see it now, like, thank you for that. And uh, like, next question will be about human quality. What human quality do you value the most in your close friends, family, or in friendship in general? Trust. Trust. You know, I have a very small inner circle. 
And it's because I have throughout my life, I've learned over the years that for me to be successful, I know that success is not a lone wolf journey. You know, and John Maxwell says one is too small a number to achieve success in anything. So I know that from my own personal experience, but those who I can trust, it's not when the best of times, how they work with me and how they're around me, it's the most challenging of times. Who can I rely on? Who can I call? And if I make a phone call, that person will be there, no question to ask, and I know they got my back. So for me, especially as I become more and more of a public figure, because I'm uncomfortable, sometimes when I'm walking at at these conferences and, and I've been at, you know, like the ATD International Conference, that's coming up. That'll be the 22nd or 23rd year I've spoken at that conference. I'm one of the most popular speakers there. When I was walking through San Diego last year, just outside the conference center, the entire Taiwanese delegation of like 30 people just came around me and they wanted to talk to me and sign me, talk, you know, take pictures and everything. I'm uncomfortable being a public figure like that because I'm not doing this for the notoriety or anything. I just do it for the love of giving, right? So for me, being a public figure, I know I can't trust and give trust to everybody. I give trust to everybody, but I recognize I, can't, I have to have a closer inner circle. And, uh, and so that's what's important to me is if I can trust you and you can trust me, there's nothing better than that. So that's the human quality that I, I love the most. Without many questions, without judgment, just like to be, to be around. Yeah. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know what and and trust mean? that they will tell me that when I, if I need to do something different or I need to hear the hard message, they can deliver that message. Because I, I trust them enough to know that they've got my best interest at heart. So I'm open to listening to any of the people who are in my inner circle to say, you know, you're doing great or you really should reconsider that. I'll listen. Yeah. Yes, great. And on the flip side, what quality do you value the least? Like what aspect of someone's uh, character can truly disappoint you? Um, selfishness and unwilling to see other people's perspectives. So a lack of empathy. Uh, mm-hmm. If you lack empathy and you are so wedded into your own individual lens and the way you see things and, and can't empathize with others and, and can't see others, then you generally don't stay in my circles for very long. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, I got it. I get it. I accept it. It's a it's, it's great point. And I'm really curious about, like, do you have like your favorite place? Perhaps it's a forest on like national park or beach, like um, something like that. Special spot, really special spot for you. It's very interesting you ask that question because you've traveled a lot. And when I, the 32 countries are just the, the professional countries. I've actually been to 45 total. And when I think about a favorite spot, it's strange that it, it is San Diego. I love San Diego. From the first time I went to San Diego, I fell in love with the place. Over the years, you know, I've taken different people that I was dating. And and when I was married, I took my wife there. It was just one of my favorite places. It's a place where I can go. It's so beautiful. And Coronado Beach and just the, the natural beauty there, but just the weather, the food, the culture, it's so beautiful there. I feel when I walk around San Diego, whether it's in in downtown, I love the downtown, but I also love the beach area and just the 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 region. And there's areas around there that are cliffs, and I just feel at at, um, at peace there. So it's a weird thing. Every time I go to San Diego, I have this you know it hits me in the heart. Like, like, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Oh my God! Yes, I love it. And you know, you told about that's where I travel a lot, and uh, but like somewhere we really feel something like another like in our heart and um, now i live in south florida in fort lauderdale near the atlantic ocean and you know i was really so surprised because now for me it's like a meditation it's like a really so peaceful place near the ocean in the morning when it's sunrise i love to be like in the early morning near the ocean and i can do it um like just um on weekends, I'm early bird, and in the weekend now, in summer, I can be near the ocean near 7 a.m., 6.45. And it's not like so energetic, but it's so calm place for me where I am in harmony. And just now I understood like that's 
It's a great place and now I know a lot about sunrises, about the ocean because the ocean and vibes can be different and like the sky can be different in the morning because I've never did it before. Can you imagine every weekend I meet sunrise in the ocean and it's so like peaceful and calm for me. And now I can see the difference between Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean because like last month I came to LA and the Pacific Ocean. It's another energy, another water, another sky, another horizon, like everything is different. Now it's one of my favorite place. And second favorite place, I remember that it's, it's in Moscow. It's a Linka street. It's really so beautiful and like so historical place in the center of Moscow. And when you're walking through the, the street, it, you feel so good, like in the spring when it's sunshine and like a green trees and like feel the breeze and like you can walk and you're like, like so feel so light. And yes, and this is emotions which we save in our heart. And it's like a trigger when we are inside, we can feel these feelings and it's so good for us. And I think we need to have some different kinds of spot with a different kind of energy to recharge ourselves. I was in San Diego just one time in ATD uh, last year and I love it. Pacific Ocean and like, yes, it's a different vibes. Uh, I love it. I love it. And my last three questions will be the same for all my guests. First of all, what was the last thing you asked ChatGPT? Hmm. I think I, it was, what are the top 10 ways to evaluate a leadership development program? Because <laughs> I, I have my own top 10 list and I was curious yes. to see what it would come up with. And, and out of the, yeah, that was the last one I asked. And out of that question, um, I had, we had a match between ChatGPT and my own list of yeah. seven, seven out of the 10. Yes. No. Did you have a great conversation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we did. We, we we had a couple of iterations. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yes, great. Yeah. I love it. Tell your favorite quatrain or maybe some lyrics from music uh, and explain why exactly you choose it. So my favorite piece from music is from Jay-Z, and I don't remember the exact lyrics, but his whole point in that song was it's about being better than you are today and never giving up. Because that's my motto. My motto in life that I created for myself is helping people be better than they were yesterday. I forget the lyrics exactly how he had it, but that's what he was talking about. So uh, I'm all about adding value and helping people be better than they were yesterday. And I just love doing that, however I yes. can. Great. And I love it. And I love Jay-Z, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yes. And the final question will be like, ask the next guest on my podcast. Here's how it goes. Every guest gets to throw a question at the next guest. And I believe it adds like, you know, a unique touch, allowing the previous guest to pose a, a question to the next one. Last week, Artrell Williams was my wonderful guest and he passed on his question to you. Are you ready to answer? Uh, yes, go for it. If there were three key points that he had to put on his tombstone or his epitaph about what he left on this world, what would he want those things to be? What three main things would he like for people to remember about him long after he's gone? Number one, he lived to the fullest. Number two, he gave all he could. And number three, he made the world better. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. And like, thank you for sharing. And I suggest asking you a question for the next guest who will be my next guest. Like, yes. And I will ask. Okay. So for your next guest, I think it would be very intriguing to ask that person this question. What is the biggest challenge that you've overcome that you didn't think you could? Yes. Great question. Thank you. And you know what? Like, guess what? We made it. <laughs> Here we go. 
Sardic, oh my God. It was amazing. Like so comfortable to talk to you and Same. like it was great and like, you know, so valuable conversation for me too. And I knew a lot now about you, about your professional side, about your personality. It's so brilliant for me, like like a diamond, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do. It's, it's really important. So like like a world for me so 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 much thank you so much well thank you uh tomorrow for this i think very highly of you having just met you at the conference i you're clearly a globe trotter a transformational expert you are amazing so i'm blessed and honored to number one be a part of your circle and super honored to be a part of your your product here so thank you for the opportunity to be here with you and um, i'm looking forward to continuing to watch you Make a world of a difference, because you do. And so we draw the curtains on yet another remarkable episode. A heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you for accompanying us on this enlightening journey through our podcast. Your unwavering support is truly appreciated and I'm filled with gratitude for the chance to embark on this exploration and learning journey alongside you. Sardik, I'm confident that our exchange has left a lasting impact, enriching and motivating all who have turned in. It's been a joy to initiate this meaningful conversation about leadership, courage and the thirst for knowledge about the world around us. Once again, thank you for being an integral part of our podcast family. Stay tuned for more captivating episodes filled with engaging conversations and narratives that inspire. Until we meet again, take care, stay curious and continue shining brightly. Bye!